Good afternoon to all of our journalists for joining us today on Major League Soccer's video teleconference call to discuss the return of Major League Soccer and the MLS is back tournament. My name is Dan Cordemanch. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Our commissioner, Don Garber, will have some formal remarks, then we'll follow it with a Q&A session, kind of standard format. For those of you who are familiar with Zoom, you can ask questions by hitting the raise your hand icon. And then Krista Mann and the MLS communications staff will put you in the queue uh, and uh, we will go from there. So once again, thanks to our journalists for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Major League Soccer's commissioner, Don Garber for some opening comments. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and I appreciate everybody uh, joining all of us here today uh, for the announcement that uh, finally for 2020 MLS is back. And as you all know, our 25th season began and only sort of lasted two uh, full weeks. Uh, and then uh, we all started managing through uh, the COVID pandemic and uh, we uh, postponed play and then worked for the last couple of months uh, to put together uh, a plan, uh, one that would assure the health and safety of our players and one that would deliver uh, exciting uh, content on the field uh, for our fans, for our partners, and, uh, and ultimately uh, get our sport and get our league back doing what we do best, which is to play soccer. Uh, we will begin on July 8th, as you all have already heard, with a tournament that's going to feature all of our teams at one site. That's the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World in Florida. And as you know from our last conversations, uh, this is a project that uh, literally took uh, nearly three months uh, to pull together and the culmination of efforts from everyone throughout the league office, through our clubs, our great partners at Disney and ESPN, uh, and in conjunction with uh, a number of infectious disease consultants and our own uh, chief medical officers, both at the league uh, and at our respective clubs. You know, we selected Orlando because we wanted a neutral site where we could bring all 26 of our teams together to do it in a format that we thought would be compelling uh, and to partner with a company that has uh, best-in-class operational excellence, something that they teach classes on and one uh, that uh, really has us feeling that there is no better company uh, to provide us with the certainty of being able to manage all of the operational needs of putting what is nearly 2,000 people uh, into uh, one environment for uh, what will be from four to five weeks. Uh, all of our clubs have been returning to individual team training, only a handful of them have been able to conduct full team training. Uh, the fact that we don't now have or that we don't have any real certainty uh, as to when we can get our teams into full team training. Some of them will arrive uh, at the Disney Complex early, uh, as early as June 24th, and begin training and getting prepared uh, for the first games on on July 8th. Uh, I wanted to really thank uh, all of our players and the MLSPA and their leadership uh, for working with us uh, through what was a, a difficult uh, negotiation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Brad Connor and Marco Batuki and our doctors that worked on our, uh, our uh, protocol plans. And I really want to thank Josh DeMauro, who runs the Disney Parks, and Roz Durant, who uh, oversees uh, the Wide World of Sports Complex. And I want to really particularly thank Jimmy Pitaro, uh, who oversees ESPN, for his belief in this project from the very beginning. You know, I also want to take a moment to recognize uh, what uh, has been overshadowing this uh, entire uh, return to play uh, plan, which has been uh, all of us uh, uh, managing through uh, and recognizing and confronting the issues that have arisen out of uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, and bringing to light all of the racial injustice, the inequality, the violence against black men and women uh, that have existed in our country uh, for way too long. As I stated during the last call that we have, uh, it, it's not just enough to post uh, social media posts, and it's not just enough to have ad campaigns. Uh, we now need to begin the really important task of 
uh, for us, bringing together the entire MLS community, our clubs, our owners, our players, uh, our partners, uh, to address these issues and to try to create programs uh, that can lead to meaningful change. Uh, it starts with dialogue, and that dialogue has begun, uh, but now it has to turn into a real commitment to action, including our league and our clubs uh, supporting financially those organizations that can make a difference uh, to address these systemic issues in our world, and clearly uh, to take our lead in trying to address these issues that exist in the sport of soccer, both on the field and off the field, in our offices, uh, within the youth uh, and amateur movement, I think we have a real um, ability uh, to take a leadership uh, in, uh, in creating programs that can address these challenges and problems uh, and inequalities that exist in our sport. I think all of you have seen in the press release the details of the, of the tournament. Our clubs, as I mentioned, some will arrive on June 24th. Those clubs will begin training. Those that can train at home uh, will stay home, but they need to arrive in uh, Orlando a week before the tournament starts. We came up with this concept of a 54-match uh, tournament, similar to the very successful World Cup here in 1994, where 24, only 24 nations competed. And as you all know, that was the last time there was only a 24-nation tournament. Each team will have a minimum of three games in the group phase or the group stage. Those results will count for the 2020 MLS regular season standings, and then that will continue when we're able to continue our season when we're back in our home markets. The group stage will be followed by a knockout round that will culminate in the championship round that will take place on uh, August 11th. The tournament will include a prize pool of $1.1 million, and that will be uh, allocated to teams uh, and technical staff that win as they go through the tournament. And very importantly, something that was just finalized this morning with the support of CONCACAF and U.S. Soccer and the Canadian Soccer Association, the winner of the tournament will earn a spot in the 2021 Scotiabank CONCACAF Champions League. Tomorrow, we're going to have a live draw that will decide the six groups, and that'll take place at 3.30 Eastern and will be aired on MLSsoccer.com on YouTube, YouTube, and all the various league and team social media channels. Uh, I know that there will be some questions on medical protocol, so just a couple of notable points to start. Uh, as I mentioned, that from the very beginning, we put together a team of infectious disease doctors and consultants that work with us and our various chief medical officers to ensure we have the right protocols in place to manage it within uh, the environment of a neutral site to begin sourcing uh, testing, uh, both testing for PCR and for serology, ensuring that we had the least uh, uh, impact on any tests uh, that were going to be available for the general public. You should know that there will be uh, a donation of serology tests that will uh, uh, provide for free to residents in Central Florida. Quick note for the media, and I think Dan can give you more details on that, uh, we are creating a policy for some journalists to attend uh, the event. Uh, they'll give you details uh, about how to secure credentials, and I hope that some of you will be able uh, to join us. More to that, uh, more on that will come in the days and week ahead. As it relates to fan engagement in television, uh, we very much knew from the very beginning that producing games in an environment outside of our stadiums and without fans would be challenging. Challenge operationally but certainly a challenge from a productive production perspective. We'll invest deeply in uh, creating uh, a, an environment on, on air that will be exciting and compelling uh, for all of our viewers. We'll see new technologies being used from an audio perspective, from a camera perspective, with new angles, with new types of cameras being used, all sorts of technological uh, innovations that might uh, be uh, technologies that we'll be able to utilize uh, in the future. Uh, every game will be televised across our three national partners and will be distributed via a world feed for our international uh, partners. And as you could uh, imagine, as you've seen very successfully uh, in other leagues and, and other events that have been taking place uh, within a virtual environment, 
Uh, we will work to integrate our fans into these broadcasts, those details and, and production uh, 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 projects are just uh, in their final stages. We're not yet ready to announce those, but I know that you can be sure that we will have an environment that will bring our fans and our supporters uh, close uh, to these matches. Uh, the future, uh, obviously, uh, we're going to be in a new normal, if not a next normal, for what uh, uh, it will look like when we return to our stadiums from a medical perspective. Uh, obviously, the project here in Orlando is, in, is incredibly ambitious. Uh, we will have the same level of focus on testing and ensuring the safety of our players and staff once we do uh, return uh, to market. All those medical protocols are being worked on both locally and nationally. Uh, we do not have yet uh, exposure as to what the future for the MLS schedule will look like uh, in 2020 and how many markets will have fans, uh, if any. But I could assure you that uh, we're working closely with our clubs and our clubs are working closely with local uh, state and, uh, and medical authorities to ensure when we do return, we're doing it in accordance, w- accordance with local guidelines. Uh, with that, I appreciate everybody coming together and I'm here to answer any questions. All right. For our journalists, once again, a a reminder, you can raise your hand to be put into the queue. The first uh, seven journalists will go as follows. Uh, We will have Stephen Goff of The Washington Post with the first question, followed by Jeff Carlisle with ESPN.com, Drake Hills with the Tennessean and USA Today Sports Network, Doug McIntyre with Yahoo, Ian Thomas with Front Office Sports, Jabari Young with CNBC, and Arch Bell. Uh, And then we'll continue with uh, the questions. So we are going to open it up for Steve Goff of The Washington Post. Steve? Hey, Don. How are you? Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Steve. Uh, What is, you know, you mentioned the the future beyond this tournament, and it was in the press release also that you actually have some parameters starting to come together for what things look like down the road. What is, you you touched on this a bit last week, but where we, where do you stand right now on your level of optimism that something in some fashion will come together for you to resume uh, in market games um, this calendar year? Uh, I'm very optimistic, uh, uh, Stephen. I, I expect that we will be back in our stadiums. We just don't know the exact date. Obviously, this is all unfolding uh, in real time, and uh, literally every day, uh, more and more markets are opening. And what I find interesting is they're the markets that you expect uh, to open up later uh, uh, in, uh, on a, in, in the curve or, or in timetable. Uh, so I do believe we'll get back to our markets. I think all of our fans should expect that to happen. When that will happen is still uh, uh, uncertain. Uh, and whether or not we'll have any markets with fans is also uh, uncertain, but we're we're also uh, hearing about uh, uh, different uh, guidelines that have been established uh, state by state, where there's even a possibility that some fans uh, might be able to attend games. All right. Apologies. You got to love the mute mute and unmute button for uh, Zoom. So continuing, we've got Jeff Carlisle with uh, ESPN.com. Hi, Don. How are you? Good, Jeff. Thank you. Um, With regard to the testing protocols, I read in the release that there are going to be temperature screenings and standardized screening questionnaires for everyone that's working at the the wide world of sports complex, as well as the hotels. how concerned are you about that being a possible avenue of transmission in terms of COVID-19 for the players and staff? And, and why aren't you testing the, those individuals who are going to come in contact either at the hotel or at the complex? Well, again, Jeff, I think the key point there is those uh, staff people will not be coming in close contact with our players. Uh, and if they were going to be in close contact, then uh, we would manage it through a different protocol uh, so we're all going to be living in a world where uh, we, we're not going to be able to test every uh, person that comes in contact with each other or comes in contact uh, with uh, uh, us as we go on with our uh, with our lives. 
Uh, we do need to manage social distancing. We will have that in place. We will need to uh, manage uh, uh, face masks and other PPE uh, for anybody that is involved in, in this project. Uh, we will have sanit- sanitizing uh, and, and other uh, things like temperature checks and, and the like for uh, those that are involved in, in uh, the, the hotels and, and involved in housekeeping and the like. Uh, but those are, those are not our employees. Uh, and uh, we're confident, uh, having gone through this protocol, both with our own infectious disease doctor, but also in sharing that with the MLSPA's infectious disease advisor, but also with the state authorities, Jeff. So uh, this is a protocol that uh, we're confident uh, about, uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, manage uh, uh, with, with real discipline. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question will go to Drake Hills with the Tennessean and USA Today Sports Network. Drake? Thanks, Commissioner. There was a bit of uh, reorganization when it comes to where teams are, where their conferences are, obviously with Nashville SC going to the Eastern Conference. What was the, the thought behind that? What was the process in making that move for the tournament, but also for the possible return into MLS markets in the fall? And can this be a move that is permanent for 2021 and beyond? Well, you know, it's too premature to talk about the permanency of it. It certainly made sense for the tournament. We needed to balance it out. And the logical move was with Nashville. But as you know, we've spoken about this. You know, we are an expanding league and and we're having teams come in to different regions of the country. And there will be realignment at some point in our league as we continue uh, to look at uh, expansion through 30 teams. But uh, the decision for now is, is simply about how we're going to manage it in the tournament. All right. Thank you, Drake. Our next question, we're going to go to Doug McIntyre with Yahoo Sports. Doug? All right. Do we have Doug McIntyre? I'm going to check with our folks behind the scenes. Krista Mann? Doug, uh, Doug's line has been unmuted. Doug, are you there? I think Doug might have to unmute his own line is what I'm uh, hearing. It might be Doug's computer. So what we'll do is we will return to Doug McIntyre shortly once we get some of the technical questions ironed out. And we will throw it over to Ian Thomas with Front Office Sports if we could unmute Ian's line. Ian, are you there? Uh, yes, Dan. Thanks. Uh, Perfect. Thank you. Hi, Don. I, I know you've previously made some comments regarding the revenue shortfall the league is going to face without games and home markets, game day revenue. What sort of things, if any, is the league preparing to do in Orlando to potentially open up some new revenue lines or, or try some new things to generate some incoming dollars? Well, you know, the, the first focus is to retain some of the revenue that – uh, we have uh, planned for in our agreements with sponsors and broadcasters and being able to have a tournament like this that has as many games as it will have as many as three a day will allow us to fulfill our uh, some of our obligations to our uh, media partners and sponsors both nationally and locally and that's that's important you know our clubs as as you all everybody on the call knows our clubs are reliant on game day revenue and without fans uh, and the normalcy of how we operate our business, it's uh, incredibly difficult. Uh, in addition, we have national revenue uh, that has been uh, uh, really challenged without being able to deliver for our national partners. Similarly, our local teams have local sponsors that they uh, sell that are uh, receiving uh, exposure in national broadcasts and, and, and other uh, media and this will allow us to fulfill uh, a portion of that revenue. Uh, I don't believe that there'll be much new revenue opportunity here outside of the fact that we have been thinking about investing in unique technologies uh, and we're going to be testing some of those technology testing some of that technology uh, down in Orlando virtual advertising you'll see a, a very unique way of delivering on on virtual advertising uh, within our broadcasts. And I also think that there's some great ways to incorporate fans. And uh, I think coming out of 
uh, of the pandemic and, and the uh, reconfiguration of, of all of our 2020 seasons. I think there'll be some unique ways that we'll uh, be able to provide, uh, you know, our, our, our clubs and certainly the league with ways of looking at new, new revenue utilizing some of this technology. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we're going to return to Doug McIntyre. Following Doug McIntyre, we'll have Jabari Young with CNBC, Arch Bell, Avi Creditor with uh, Sports Illustrated, and Sam Steschko with The Athletic. So we're going to go back to Doug McIntyre, who I believe is unmuted now. Are you there, Doug? Sounds like we're still working on Doug. Apparently, Doug has to do it on his computer. Uh, Letting me Guys. Doug, we, ha we can hear you. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, not sure what happened there, but uh, thanks for doing this, Don. Appreciate it. Just wanted to follow up on Jeff's question. Um, I'm just curious how non-MLS staff, servers, bus drivers, the folks that clean rooms are not going to be coming into contact with players. I'm not sure how that works exactly. And how concerned are you about the spiking cases in the Orlando area just in these last couple of days? Well, again, uh, Doug, contact, there's a difference between contact and there's a difference with, between being in the vicinity. I don't think a, uh, a bus driver is going to be in close contact with somebody walking on the bus, for example. So somebody cleaning their room uh, is not necessarily going to be in close contact with, uh, with a player. The players are going to be in close contact with each other, and that's why they're going to be tested as frequently as they are. And any staff that is in close contact with them, the coaches – uh, that will be uh, involved in et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're, it's just a different procedure, uh, and and uh, I don't know how to describe it uh, any other way. Uh, you know, we are obviously, uh, like everybody, uh, monitoring what goes on and what has been going on with, uh, with COVID in every state, including in Florida, and the number of cases in Florida uh, have been uh, less than in many, many other places. So we're confident that uh, we'll be able to manage uh, our tournament, which is isolated from the public. Uh, and uh, again, the public is not going to have contact with them without uh, uh, wearing PPE, face masks and the like. Uh, so it's not as if the, uh, the tournament will be open to the public. There won't be any uh, uh, guests uh, in the uh, environment where we're going to be. Uh, so it's something that we are confident we'll be able to manage. All right, moving along, we're going to go to the next question, which is Jabari Young with CNBC. Jabari? How are you, sir? I hope you're doing well during this uh, time. Uh, Thank you. Uh, um, how can this, how can the MLS allow this to translate uh, into a higher valuation of maybe media rights, you know, using this format, using the excitement around it? And as you said, a lot of technology is going to be added, hopefully to improve the presentation of the media rights package or whatever um, but can they you can you guys use this moment to, to help increase that because that negotiations coming back uh, you know within a year or two I believe so Jabari. I mean it starts by getting back right we'll be uh, playing games before uh, many other leagues will in this in this country uh, albeit not by as much as we had previously hoped uh, and very importantly we wanted to, to continue the momentum that we have and continue our relationship uh, with our fans who translate into viewers. Uh, that uh, is combined with the fact that we've had a very, very engaging level of discourse with our national media partners, all who are challenged to put live sports on the air. Uh, and I, I think that relationship has been built during this process. It's been complicated, uh, and it's certainly been one that has been difficult for all. Uh, so getting back, getting back in a unique format, getting our fans engaged, uh, getting some momentum back into the league is something that I am sure uh, will continue to, you know, help what I was convinced and remain convinced, which is an increasingly valuable uh, media property. And we'll take that to market after the 22 season. All right. Thank you, Jabari. Our next question will go to Arch Bell. Arch. Thank you, Dan. Hi, Commissioner. I appreciate your time. My question is regarding the, the league's reigning MVP, Carlos Vela. Uh, last week, there was still uncertain whether uh, the the Los Angeles FC striker would be able to participate in this tournament. I was just curious to know if the league's received any confirmation whether uh, the Vela will be able to to play in this tournament next month. 
Well, it's really, Arch, it's really not whether he's able to play. He is able to play, right? The question is, how do we deal with a, uh, a handful of players uh, that have uh, a series of issues that we are continuing uh, to work through our clubs to manage? Uh, clearly, any player that has a medical issue, and then, to, to your point, Arch, would not uh, be able to play for medical reasons, certainly is not going to be required in any way to play. And by the way, that... That also uh, would exist for any staff people that uh, are in a vulnerable group or have pre-existing uh, conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are working with our teams to manage through those players that do have special situations. In the case of Carlos, uh, his wife's pregnant. We have other players that have uh, wives that are expecting. We have other special situations that we're managing through. And between now and the start of the tournament, uh, we and our clubs uh, we'll work with our our players to ensure that we can find the right way to manage through those issues. All right. Our next question, we will go to Avi Creditor with Sports Illustrated. Avi? Hey, Don. Uh, thanks again for uh, doing this. Two questions for you. First, uh, we saw the league statement on the national anthem in response to everything that's been going on. Um, but I was curious if the anthem will actually be played uh, at any of these games in Orlando, given that there are no fans and that lining up as teams might not exactly be social distancing friendly. Um, and second, uh, just given the overlap between the NBA and MLS in Orlando, I was just curious if there's been any discussion with Adam Silver or any NBA officials about players from each league attending each other's games um, while everyone's there. So on the first one, Avi, it was interesting. You know, I'm sure you know, and those who follow our league closely, that statement was issued in 2017. Uh, that was not a new statement, even though I've done a couple of interviews this morning, and and it was released uh, or or perceived as a brand new statement. It was just the restating, literally, of what uh, we announced in 17 uh, when this issue really came uh, to light throughout the pro sports world. Uh, and we were asked by a reporter, what's our position? And, and, and then we just reissued what we said several years ago. Uh, we won't be playing the anthem, and, and, and you hit it on the head. There's not going to be any fans in uh, the stands. Uh, so uh, we didn't see that it would be appropriate. Uh, and I feel today no different than I felt then, uh, which is uh, if a player uh, is looking to express their right uh, to kneel during the national anthem, they should have the right to do so, I would hope that they would stand, but if they opt not to, then that's their prerogative and we will support that. Uh, as it relates to the NBA, there's been a lot of discussion underneath the commissioner level. I think both Adam and I have been incredibly busy doing the things that commissioners need to do uh, in addition to just uh, create our return to play plan. But uh, there has been discussion on, uh, on the levels and on medical and communications and the like between the two leagues uh, and we have not had any discussions about attending each other's games. Uh, frankly, uh, it's not something that we've thought about yet. Uh, and if we're able to manage it in a safe way, I think it would be uh, awesome. I think it speaks to the kinds of things that we're looking to do uh, to keep our players engaged and to provide them with uh, opportunities to uh, uh, keep themselves uh, excited and busy uh, when they're not playing, you know, games will be at nine o'clock and then not, then not again until later in the evening. So obviously there's multiple fitness opportunities. There's uh, multiple pools, there's restaurants, there's things we're working with Disney on uh, to utilize, uh, whether it be golf courses and uh, all sorts of things like that. There will be a significant amount of player uh, uh, engaged activities that uh, our group is now uh, working with Disney on, um, and, and, and clearly, uh, I'm sure the NBA is doing the same thing. All right. Thank you, Avi. Uh, we're going to go to Sam Steschel next. After Sam, we'll have Jerry, Jeremy Filosa uh, from Montreal, Doug Roberson in Atlanta, Michelle Kaufman with the Miami Herald, Paul Kennedy, Soccer America, Ryan Tomich with Gold.com, and Jonathan Tannenwald with the Philadelphia Inquirer. So we will go to Sam Steschel with The Athletic for our next question. Sam? Don, thanks so much for doing this. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, I'm curious what the status um, of, I guess, buy-in or um, what the status of, of things are with referees. Um, obviously, some of them have full-time jobs outside of refereeing. Um, so I'm wondering if everything is squared away on the officiating front 
And uh, also, if you guys will have full VAR capabilities um, for these matches in Orlando. You know, it's a good question, uh, Sam, on, on Pro. Obviously, Pro is in the loop and has been part of this process. Uh, I can't share with you the specifics of that. That's probably something that Mark or Todd uh, can handle with you offline after the call. Uh, but clearly, you know, we have reached an agreement with, uh, with Pro officials and with Howard uh, to have them, uh, you know, be a uh, participant in uh, in uh, the tournament, uh, we are not going to utilize uh, VAR, but VAR will be available. Uh, and uh, I think between now and the start of the tournament, uh, we're going to figure out whether or not it's utilized for some games, uh, uh, or whether or not it's just used for you know the latter part of the tournament. But it's a good question; it's just not finalized yet. Thank you, Sam. Our next question, we will go to Jeremy Filosa. Jeremy? Bonjour, Commissioner Garber from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, thanks again for taking the time. Very much appreciated. Two quick questions. Uh, do you expect radio broadcast crews uh, as ourselves to be able to travel there and call the games on site, or will we probably be working off tube from our local cities? And second question, what can you tell MLS soccer fans uh, whose teams are involved in the Champions League this year and still really have no idea on, you know, what's possibly going to happen with that now that we know that the winner of this tournament will get Champions League uh, uh, credentials for 2021. Thank you. On the first one, uh, I, I would imagine it will be called off monitor as opposed to uh, their live for a wide variety of, of reasons, uh, not the least of which is Uh, that those radio crews would uh, not be able to come in and out of uh, the proverbial bubble. Uh, as it relates to the ongoing Champions League, uh, I don't think the, uh, the issue here is going to affect that. In essence, what this spot is replacing is in uh, 2020, the conference uh, opposite the Supporter Shield winner gets a CCL spot And this will replace that. If it happens to be a Canadian uh, team, and, and I'm, I'm sure you know this by now, uh, there will be a Canadian team that will come from uh, this tournament and then a Canadian team that will come from uh, the winner of uh, the uh, Canadian championship uh, up uh, north of the border. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Our next question, we will go to Doug Robertson down in Atlanta with the Journal-Constitution. Doug? Thank you for doing this, Don. Uh, two questions for you. How did y'all arrive at these particular game times? Two of them you know, are, are obviously sensible. The, the 9 a.m. is a little bit strange. Um, and regarding the sequestering of the players, are they all going to be in the same resort? Or are they going to be spread out around the city? How, how is that going to work? No, they're all in the same resort and the same hotel. Uh, Doug, so that, that's the, the whole point. Uh, the, the entire hotel, the, the Swan and the Dolphin Hotel, will not be open to, uh, to any other guests uh, while our, the, the large group of our players are going to be there. Uh, and then they will be able to travel in buses with each team having their own bus to uh, the Disney uh, Wide World of Sports uh, Complex. Uh, the game times are a function of weather. You know, nine o'clock in the morning is actually a time that uh, uh, one of our broadcast partners is very excited about. Uh, they're looking uh, to have programming there. And as you know, there are other soccer leagues that do broadcast games at that time, albeit they play them uh, at a different time of the day. But it is a time when we think we and feel we could manage uh, the weather. And clearly those times later in the evening uh, will allow us to be able to have those games outside of the warmest Uh, uh, time of the day. All right. For our journalist, our next question will go down to Miami with the Miami Herald, Michelle Kaufman. Hey, Don, can you hear me? You can, Michelle. Okay, um, great. I just had a quick question. Uh, do you have a, um, oh, I have two actually. One is, do you have a return weekend in mind for after this term when you talk about returning to home markets is there a weekend that you guys have in mind that you would like to try to return to home markets and um, my second question is uh, for the media that do choose to go to cover some of the games from the stands um, will there be a media hotel or do we just kind of stay wherever we want 
Let me let me just not uh, give give details yet. Michelle, we're still working on them as it relates to media, and Dan will uh, get to our whole media contingent and uh, and provide information once we uh, are able to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't have a start date yet as to when we would return. Uh, and I would imagine that sometime in the next, uh, probably not for you know the next four or five weeks. Uh, will we be able to actually provide that uh, that date? All right. Thank you, Michelle. We'll continue with uh, Soccer America's Paul Kennedy. Paul, I believe your line has been unmuted. Paul? Thanks very much. Uh, the question I have is, will high-risk individuals like players, say, with diabetes, I can think of Jordan Morris, uh, be allowed to play, and whose decision will it be made to regarding players like that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, it, it would be the player's decision in conjunction with and consultation with their doctors, their personal doctors, and their team doctors. And nobody who has any pre-existing medical condition where their doctor doesn't believe it is uh, safe for them to play would be uh, required or even encouraged to do so. So in the case of Jordan, that will be entirely uh, up to Jordan uh, and his medical team. And just a, a quick clarification, Dan just sent me a note, uh, apparently that uh, VAR uh, will be at the tournament. So that's uh, changed over the last couple of days. All right, we will continue uh, with, with our questions from journalists. We're going to have Ryan Tolmich with uh, Goal.com in a moment, and we'll have Jonathan Tannenwald with the Philadelphia Inquirer. And we're going to wrap it up with Mark Burns with the Sports Business Journal. Um, as I have booked Commissioner Garber with Colin Coward for a live TV interview. So apologies to our journalists. We will uh, we will go with Ryan Tolmich with Gold.com. Ryan? Hey, Don, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Just, you know, obviously this is a, a unique time in, in American sports as a whole right now with, with all these leagues trying to come back. And you guys are kind of in the lead with that and that the NBA is kind of looking at later in July, MLB still sorting out, so is NHL. How important is it to kind of have that that first time slot for you? Obviously, you look at the Bundesliga and, and how much that's meant to them in terms of marketing and exposure and everything like that. How important is this competition format and that timing uh, to this league and, and kind of expanding this league? Yeah, well, it's very important, and it's why we were uh, in such uh, uh, close and uh, and at times challenging discussions with uh, the uh, players to relate, related to uh, an agreement for the work rules this year. Uh, and we, we lost some time. You know, we had hoped to be out uh, uh, way earlier than we were able to uh, finalize with a, 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 a July 8th start. We had frankly had hoped to be able to start at the latter part in June, and we're just not able to do that. So getting out early is important, and it's not necessarily getting out first because you got to get it right. Uh, but getting out there and ensuring that we have the certainty to play games is crucial to the future success of the league. To Michelle's point, with no, no question, with no certainty as to when we're going to get back into our home markets, uh, we knew that should we be able to uh, manage the medical protocols, reach an agreement with Disney, reach agreement with our players, uh, that we would be able to get out uh, and uh, get games started in July. And uh, without the concept of a tournament, we'd still be sitting here waiting, uh, like other leagues are, uh, to determine whether or not uh, we'd be uh, receiving the approvals to be able to have enough stadiums open uh, to be able to have a, uh, you know, a, a schedule of games, uh, regular season games in home markets. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Before we move to Jonathan Tannenwald with the Philadelphia Inquirer, who is our next uh, question, just a note to our journalists in the press release that we sent out today, we did have a link to video sound bites from a handful of players, certainly Commissioner Garber. One of those sound bites is Jordan Morris of the Seattle Sounders. We encourage you to uh, click on that link and listen to what Jordan had to say about the tournament. So we're going to move forward with our next question, which will go to Jonathan Tannenwald with the Philadelphia Inquirer. Jonathan. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> two questions, a short and, and, and maybe a longer. The short is I was reading the medical protocol this morning, and I'm, I, one, I, one thing I did not see is, is there a, a number of positive tests that halts the tournament, um, whether temporarily or more than temporarily, 
And secondly, does that 9 a.m. slot that, that you were discussing a minute ago, is there some international rights potential um, with that in terms of Europe and Asia and, and countries that might not otherwise be paying attention, they'll be able to watch these games? It wasn't our intent, Jonathan, to uh, when we uh, scheduled them at nine. It really was uh, very focused on on weather and when we thought it would be uh, an appropriate time to start and then take a large break during the, the hottest part of the day and then get back uh, in the evening. Uh, there is no specific protocol for how many positive tests uh, would uh, have us take a step back and think about what uh, what happens next. Uh, it's why we're so focused on regular testing uh, and uh, ensuring what, uh, what w- that we do what we need to do uh, to uh, keep our players safe uh, and then managing what would happen should a player test uh, positive. Uh, and a player test positive, obviously they're removed from uh, the tournament. Uh, they go into quarantine. There's contact tracing for those that uh, have been uh, with uh, in contact within 10 feet of that person, those people are tested uh, even more regularly than had they not been in contact with a positive test. All right. Before we go to Mark Burns with our final question, just a, a quick reminder. Uh, I know a number of people have referenced the 94 World Cup as the last World Cup with with uh, 24 teams, uh, or 24 nations. Just a reminder, I think everybody's referring to the Men's World Cup because clearly the Women's World Cup Uh, is different. And also when it comes to professional sports leagues returning, uh, Major League Soccer is returning on July 8th. And I do want to note, as we have many MLS owners who own NWSL clubs, they return also on June 27th. So we're going to wrap it up uh, with a final question from Mark Burns of the Sports Business Journal. Mark? Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Commissioner, for doing this. Uh, Quick final question for you. Did the league look at um, selling a title or presenting sponsorship to the tournament, given the loss in revenue this year. And I know it's sizable and, and maybe that doesn't make a difference, but yeah, did the league explore that at all in the last few months? Well, you know, I think you'll see uh, a, a lot of commercial uh, uh, engagement in and around the, uh, the tournament in and around the broadcasts. Uh, but we did not look at a specific title sponsor uh, but you will see our, our largest sponsors very prominently uh, positioned throughout the broadcast. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. With that, we're going to conclude today's media video call. We appreciate all of our joint journalists for joining us, and we'll certainly be following up with you offline. Thanks again. Thank you.